everybody. This is Caitlin Rule. I'm one of your New Mexico Department of Game and Fish bighorn sheep biologists. I appreciate you all showing up and your patience with us as we just had to fix one of our Zoom links here. Um, sorry for the delay, but hopefully we can just get started. Um, first off, I think we'll have the other panelists introduce themselves so that you're aware who's who's here from New Mexico Game and Fish on the call. Hi, I'm Tristana Bigford. I am the Assistant Chief of Education, and I am here to help with technical difficulties. Hopefully, we have run our course on those for the evening. <laughs> Hi, I'm Ellen Crockett. I am the State Wildlife Veterinarian for New Mexico Department of Game and Fish. And Caitlin, I'm bringing in Mariana so she can introduce herself. So she should be with us as a panelist in just a moment. OK, in the meantime, we are gonna have uh, the Q&A and chat functions open for everybody. Um, and I am no good at keeping track of all that. So that's another thing I'm Tristana is gonna help help with here along the way. Uh, Ellen said she's our, our state vet and she's hopefully gonna help answer some of those questions I, I'm, I may not best be able to address. And then we also have Marina here. Marina, you wanna in introduce yourself to everybody? Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Marina McCampbell. I'm the Northeast Regional Wildlife Biologist for New Mexico Department of Game and Fish. All right, great. So uh, we were just talking about how I feel really old school for this, but <laughs> I'm going to have a PowerPoint to share with you all. But I think the visuals are going to be pretty important, and it's the best way I know how to how to implement that in this talk. Um, let me share the screen here. And this is our inaugural run of this orientation. So we, um, I typically send the letters out, which I believe you all received in, in email, but haven't done any kind of get together. And so I'm pretty excited to have the opportunity to meet with you all and share a bunch of hopefully valuable information with you. Uh, because it's our inaugural run, it might be a little clunky. I haven't quite uh, gotten the spiel down, so to say. So bear with me on that, but we'll do our best here. I don't think it should take a whole hour, but I guess some of that might just depend on, on uh, questions and that sort of thing. So here's just a look at what we're gonna go through. We'll talk about some basics in biology. I'm gonna to talk to you about bighorn disease and sampling instructions, cause you're all gonna get a sampling kit in the mail. Uh, very briefly talk about some hunting basics. I'd like to talk about you identification for our you hunters and then a little bit on ram aging. So I think in the interest of keeping people engaged and, and giving you the opportunity to ask your questions. I think once we get through each of these five little bullets at the end of each one, um, that'll be a time where we'll address any questions that come up and you can feel free to type them as they come up for you, but we just won't really go through them until, until we've covered that section. So here's some of the general stuff, uh, bighorn sheep, typically live 10 to 15 years. Ewes are gonna live a little bit longer, uh, probably more like um, toward the 12 to 15 end. And rams, once they get to about nine are, are getting old and 12 to 13 are very old rams, although we, we do get some rams harvested in that age range. Really often I see people reporting that rams can get as big as 300 pounds, but uh, some of the the numbers here are actual weights from our captures and I think more representative of what you could expect with our Rocky Rams being a little bit bigger than desert Rams, but both over 200, likely to be up near 250 pounds. And uh, with ewes, Rocky ewes, you ewe hunters, they could be around 150 pounds. Sheep are, are kind of generalists and really opportunistic when it comes to what they eat. Um, it can, their diets can vary from place to place, even within the same subspecies, but very often they include shrubs, grasses, forbs in the desert, things like cacti. 
the hallmark of bighorn sheep habitat is that wherever it is, whatever elevation, it's very rugged and open. They rely on that steep, rugged, nasty terrain to get away, and they rely on that openness in order to detect predators. So I've just put together a couple photos. I imagine a lot of you have actually already been out and about in your unit scouting. Um, here's an example of some desert habitat. It looks really nice, nice and beautiful in this picture, but don't let that fool you. Um, the mountains are rugged for sure. And a lot of our desert habitats are much larger mountain ranges with more area to cover for scouting and hunting. So keep that in mind as you're thinking about having to do some research that there may be a wider area for you to do some looking. And also in these areas you see where it looks like it's really flat in the foothills, what you often encounter are some, um, can be some pretty deep washes where water comes off the mountain. So when you think it looks flat, expect to have to be going um, up and down a bunch of arroyos. Here's another example of some desert habitat. This photo is taken in the Hatchet Mountains, the Big Hatchets. This is one of our more, more rugged ranges. Um, one tip for you here is these, these so tall stalks make really good hiking sticks. Very light and sturdy. This is a picture from the Rio Grande Gorge. So our, our low elevation are kind of our river corridor type habitats in the San Francisco and Rio Grande Gorge. You can catch sheep up on the flats on top, but they're generally not gonna be too far away from some of that steep stuff. Keep that in mind if you're hunting, if they're across Canyon or inside below the lip, how you might be able to get to a sheep if, if you're to try to put a stock on them or get one. And then of course our alpine habitats. This photo is taken in the summer. Oops. And you can find sheep on top of these ridges, but other good spots to look of course, include the bulls. Tristana, can you, are you seeing my cursor at all? No, I'm not. Okay, that's all right. But yeah, if you look down, you can kind of tell where that bull is just below the rim. Very often there'll be groups bedded in there, avalanche shoots, those sorts of places. And this photo was actually taken in October in Alpine Habitat. So this is really just a reminder that you can get winter weather anytime up there. And even if it's not snow, it may be rain and that's almost worse. So all things to think about. Um, you know, think specific to your area, what the challenges might be in scouting and getting around once your hunt starts. So let's talk a little bit about the behavioral component. For Rockies, their rut is primarily November, December. We don't have too many herds where the hunt overlaps that just one in the gorge and we have some longer hunt windows in a few places that might cover that. Um, in the desert, we have a slightly longer rut period. Uh, I have listed here July to September, but we've flown our surveys in October and still often find rams mixed in with ewes then. So I bring this up because outside of the rut, those ram groups are likely to be really segregated from the ewe groups uh, with a little less rigid rut for the deserts, that may not necessarily be the case during your desert hunts. And then bighorn sheep have a uh, pregnancy time frame of about six months. So then you can expect to see lambs six months later. We get them usually in June in the Alpine, June or May in our low elevation rocky herds. And they can show up honestly any month of the year in our deserts, though so typically January to May is the main window for desert lambs. Some things never change. All right, I did wanna show you a video here so that you could have a break from listening to me. I'm gonna pull up Chrome. Tristana, can you tell me if this window is showing up? 
It is. It's on your Zoom window right now, so it just needs to switch to YouTube. Okay. <laughs> It's weird. Is it showing up on my, I might have to stop share for a second here. That may be better than you can make sure the sound buttons clicked. Okay. I have, I have my laptop pulled up and that screen's kind of empty and my main monitor is, is showing all the things I want to look at, but I can't click on them. Oh no. Can you do the stop share button on the current screen? No, there's nothing, there's nothing showing up on my current screen. Oh. Can you stop my sharing somehow? Possibly. You have a spreadsheet up now on the screen with the, looks like the 2019 harvest information. Okay, so that showed up. Yeah, so it's just, once it shows up on the screen, I'm not able to um, click on anything. Okay. Well, maybe I'll just continue on with this, with the PowerPoint. It might be that I have to like exit the PowerPoint or something. That, okay. Oh, no, that, let me end, there you go. Sorry, everybody. Gotta love all the sideboards they give us on our computers. <laughs> uh, well, and I'm not the best at this stuff. Okay. There you go. Can Your you video see that? Yep. Great. This six-year-old is finally ready to compete. His opponent is a bigger, stronger eight-year-old ram. challenger must provoke the fight. With body kicks and tongue flicking, he taunts his opponent. The older ram seems to walk away in submission. But his posture is known as the low stretch. It means, you want a piece of me? Come get it. of the impact delivered at 35 kilometers per hour is enough to kill a human instantly. Two layers of skull protect their brains. The fight lasts for hours, each ram battering the other dozens of times. Love our house. The outdoor space is great. Okay. Cool. So I just wanted to show that, kind of break it up a little, but also to to give everybody, you know, that up close um, visual of just how powerful and and cool and unique bighorn are. So with that, that kind of wraps up that biology basics. Um, what sorts of questions do we have?
don't have any questions at the moment. Okay. Um, we might give people just a minute to, to type if they are typing. Or if you want to jump into the next section, I can I can group them and bring them in after the next section as well. Yeah, let's do that. Okay. All right. Okay. One one question before you jump in there, Caitlin. Yeah. Uh, do they typically feed morning, evening, or all day? I would say all day. They can feed all day. You know, this is actually something I go back and forth on because I've heard some people talk about bighorn being crepuscular, which is, you know, active at dawn and active at dusk. Um, and certainly this time of year when it's really hot, they really, they very much are, you know, they're going to be active at the coolest times of day. But once things cool off, it's pretty regular for them to have an active period at first light, uh, bed down for a couple hours, but then be active again and then bed down, you know, and ruminate. So you can find them up and on their feet really any time of day um, with the sidebars that if it's super hot, you know, they may be less likely to be active. And uh, another thing on their timing is that unless they've been bumped, it's very likely that they're going to stay pretty much in the same area overnight. And so you got the second question that, that popped up with your with your answer there. And um, the next question is, do they have babies? Yes. Um, maybe a, who, maybe question. whoever asked that might add a little bit to it. I'm not sure what they're trying to get at. Doug, if you want to just add a little to it, we can we can come back to that question. And that's all I have so far, Caitlin. Okay. Cool. Oh, I, I lied. One more. <laughs> yeah. Oh, two more. A couple more. Okay. When is the desert bighorn rut again? So I would say the the peak window is July through September, but they really can be still found in with use um on the on the other ends of that. So June, October, maybe even November. The difference between deserts and Rockies is mainly the seasonality. Um, Rockies need to have their lambs in the summer because winter comes around pretty quick and lasts a while. So June is an optimal time to have lambs and they have a really narrow window where they have lambs, which means their window is also narrow. On the desert side of things, they don't really have that stark seasonality. And in fact, um, there's a lot of variability year to year and when when environmental conditions are are good in terms of when it rains and when sheep are in the best condition kind of varies. So from that standpoint, they have a much wider lambing window and a much wider rut window. And we have seen lambs pretty much every month of the year on deserts, which means there could be rut activity any month of the year. But again, the, the primary months for desert rut are July through September. So then, you know, extrapolate out a little bit um, it'll taper off in the framing months. Awesome. Um, and then when the rut ends, do they tend to separate from the ewes? Yes. Yep. When, when they're not rutting, they tend to be in totally separate groups. You might have young rams in with ewes, and we'll talk about that a little later, but, but otherwise the older rams are going to be in their own, um, bachelor groups. Great. And then to expand a little bit on the previous question, um, do they typically have babies in winter? I think you may have addressed that with, they try to get them in those summer months so they're they're ready for the winter. Yeah, so the Rocky Mountain subspecies have their lambs in, in the summer in June, but the desert bighorn will have their lambs in the winter to spring. Again, Great. with a wider lambing season then. And then I think the next question we're going to get to in a little bit. So if we need to hold it, let me know. Um, for the Taos Gorge area, how do you best judge age? So we'll talk a little bit about age later. And that does remind me, you know, since we've got folks from all over the state, different hunt units on here, I'll probably not, not talk specifically about area stuff. But that question is actually the same regardless of where we're talking about. But we'll get to that later. So great. I think that's all of the questions. Um, I don't think I missed anybody, but thank you, Caitlin. 
Okay, cool. So let's talk a little bit about disease in bighorn sheep. Uh, all bighorn sheep managers across the West would probably agree that respiratory disease or pneumonia is the biggest challenge facing bighorn sheep uh, on the largest scale. Pneumonia is kind of complicated. Caitlin? Yep. Sorry to interrupt you. Um, can you adjust the screen a little bit? There's two layers. Um, there's one oh, with the, the video and then there's the, I think the PowerPoint's behind it. That's weird. Okay, let's try again. Not sure why it keeps pulling it up that way. Did it the same thing again? Huh. So there you Is go. It, that's that better. Yep. I don't know what I pressed, but we'll go with it. Perfect. <clears throat> so I want to talk to you about disease because we're going to ask for your help with collecting some samples. Disease is a really big issue for bighorn in general, and it's become more of an issue in New Mexico of late. So what we in the past, we've made limited requests with hunters and specific units for gathering some of this information for us, but we are going to send kits out to everybody. To give you some quick background, um, pneumonia can involve multiple bugs that make sheep sick, but the primary one we're interested in is called mycoplasma ova pneumoniae. And that is really a mouthful. We call it MOVI for short. Um, the consequences of a herd getting infected with this bacteria can uh, vary widely. On, on average, you see a median decline of 48% within a herd. We've been fortunate that we haven't seen that sort of abrupt decline in our herds yet. Um, but often something that's characteristic of sheep battling respiratory disease is that those herds have chronic low lamb survival. I've listed here some of the places that we have found this bug, and some of that is through our capture efforts, but some of it is also through hunter sampling. So you being able to collect some samples for us will be really important to our understanding of, of the health in the different bighorn sheep herds. This is what you're going to get in the mail. Um, on the left, you see a blood tube with that red and black rubber stopper on top. And underneath that is a little pipette, you know, basically like an eyedropper. And so you'll have two options and all these ins instructions are included in the kit. You can either use that pipette once you're field dressing your animal to get some blood out and put it inside that tube by removing the rubber stopper, or you can just take the stopper off. And if there's a pool of relatively clean blood, you can just uh, scoop it inside the body cavity. So that, that blood sample will allow us to understand if that sheep has been exposed to the bacteria. On the right-hand side is an image of a nasal swab and then the cylinder that you'll be putting the nasal swab into. And that's basically just a super long a Q-tip, kind of like you put in your ear, but it has a really long shaft. And, and you'll put that inside the nasal cavity, swirl it around uh, both sides, and then put it in the, the graduated tube. Again, there's going to be clear instructions with your kit, but just to give you a sense for what's coming. Um, I might break here and see if, Ellen, did you have anything specific to add that I that I missed on this? I don't think so, Caitlin. You're doing great. Okay, let's see. All right, here's where I wanted to show you uh, a video that talks a little bit about this uh, pneumonia or respiratory disease in bighorn sheep and, and why it's important for us to be keeping track of. So that I will pull up that video for you. And I'm just gonna play a little snippet. Um, but this is on YouTube. If you're interested, you can you can watch more of it, and it's on the Wild Sheep Foundation website. To study wild sheep for a couple of different reasons. There are a bunch of real steep cliffs. We've got these great open grazing meadows. I mean, she's behind it. Oh, she's got me right there. 
in the fall, the thing that we're most interested in is their rut, which is their period of mating. There is a well-established dominance hierarchy among the rams. It's very intense. directly to the spring stuff where we're trying to understand lamb survival. It was a lamb. But you know it's lamb, right? Yeah. She looks great to me. She does. She got the little lamb smile. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the bighorn sheep, I mean, to me, one of the most beautiful things there is. Bighorn sheep are icons of the west, of the wild. They're magnificent creatures. They're amazing. Never falling, jumping up from rock to rock, jumping up sheer cliffs. These animals are really smart. And, you know, they've been here a long time. 400 years ago, there were probably in excess of a million bighorns. Bighorn sheep used to be ubiquitous in this part of the world until Europeans came for domestic sheep. By the 1920s, many of the historic bighorn herds were gone combination of unregulated hunting as well as diseases that were transmitted to bighorns from domestic sheep had tremendous impact on the bighorn sheep. Around 1950, people really started focusing on how poor the population of bighorn sheep were and how they could maybe increase them by reintroducing bighorn sheep back into these ranges from which they'd been extirpated. A lot of these populations started reproducing and coming back and increasing in their numbers. Having enough habitat for wild sheep is a concern. Predation, nutrition, and genetics are all concerns. But all of those concerns combined don't equal the threat of infectious disease. Okay, so I just wanted to kind of reiterate this video talked about it. We can have our bighorn herds transmit this bacteria movi from one herd to the next, but very often um, the initial disease spillover will come from something like domestic sheep or goats. And so it's really important for us to do everything we can to keep them separate. I think that ends our disease section. Do we have any questions related to disease? We do. Um, can you talk a little bit about storing the samples? Is there, how do you keep them cool? Is there a good temperature? How should they store them and ship them back to us? So what, what we've done in the past, and then I'll have Ellen jump in here because we've never had a vet before, um, but I think she'll probably uh, say the same thing. Once you get that sample, if you can keep it cool as quick as possible, that's the best thing. Um, get it in a refrigerator when you get home. Um, those of you who are on ram hunts, you're gonna be coming in to get your head sealed anyway. So if you can get it in the refrigerator and then just bring it into the office till then, that's just fine. Of course, the sooner it comes in, the better, but you know we understand that, that you guys are are doing a big thing for us and, and we'll take them whenever you can bring them in. Anything else with ha uh, sample handling, Ellen? Yeah, I'll just jump in really quick. Um, you're right, it's it's best if they get cool as, as quickly as possible. But the good news about the tests that we're running is that they're very, very stable tests. So um, 
you know, while it's best that they stay cool, I don't want that to deter any of you guys from collecting samples. If you're like, oh, I'm not going to get to a fridge anytime soon. I still want you to take the samples and put them in a fridge if you can, because that would be so helpful for us. Um, but ideally just pop them in a fridge or a freezer and, and that's the best case scenario. Great. And when do you anticipate those kits being mailed out, Caitlin or Ellen, whoever's mailing them? Yeah, I'm mailing them out. I actually put everybody whose hunt starts in August, I, I um, sent put those in the mail last week. So if your hunt starts in August, you should be getting one soon. And I hope, you know, week by week to attack it that way. Um, if you're getting worried that you haven't received your kit yet and your hunts, you know, a couple weeks away, let me know and I'll double check if I had sent it or not. Great. Um, and then shifting gears a little bit, are the diseases and the main reason Rockies have been, have long been introduced to new areas, sorry, let me start that over. Are the disease, the main reason Rockies have been long, long been introduced to new areas like Largo Canyon? Um, yeah, so we're talking about an area in, in New Mexico. Um, I think the main reason we haven't gone there is that it's it's not known to be historic bighorn sheep habitat. And at this point we have filled above and beyond what's known to be historic bighorn sheep habitat. You know, that said, domestics in potential reintroduction sites are are definitely a concern and and would prevent us from bringing bighorn sheep there. But probably more so is just that it's not the best bighorn habitat. Um, especially since we've had more pinion juniper encroachment. Those canyons are a little bit thicker than they used to be. Great. Um, and then can hunters report observations on diseased sheep while they're hunting in the field? Like if they see coughing or dead sheep, et cetera. Yeah, absolutely. We'd love to know any of that. Um, you know, if you're close enough and can get a video of of sheep that you think look sick, uh, that'd be super helpful too. Um, but yeah, feel free to share any observations from the field that you want to. We'd definitely be interested in hearing about observations of, of sick sheep. And I believe that's all the disease related questions. Um, can you once again talk about where to uh, deliver the, the samples to once they've been collected from the field? Yeah, they can go to any regional office so Santa Fe and Albuquerque are, are generally the best bets, but whatever is um, most convenient for you, we'll take it from there. So that's Santa Fe, Albuquerque, Raton, Las Cruces, Roswell. Yeah. Okay. And then I had two questions that are back to the biology. Um, do rams and ewes segregate within a common bowl or separate across ridges? So. The difference is there, I guess, I guess you could still have uh, a ram group and a U group within the same basin, but they're mainly going to associate with their own sex. Um, you know, getting into a, a little more biology, rams are definitely more likely to wander farther away from that escape terrain. So ewes, especially ewes with little lambs, are going to want to stick pretty close to really steep, rugged stuff. Rams like that country too, but they're also a little bit less, uh, they're a little bit, they're not as worried about wandering far from that escape terrain. So you may catch them in some, you know, a little bit gentler areas and, and probably in more areas period than you would find use. Great. Um, and I have an area specific question, which I know you want to avoid. So this may be a short and sweet answer, but for the gorge, is the rut on now or will it be delayed a little bit? So the, the gorge has rocky, so that's gonna be around November. A little bit later. And then I have one more question on, on how big can sheep grow, but I think you're gonna come back to that. So we'll save that question for a future break. Sure, sounds good. Cool. Okay. Oh, and Caitlin, um, yep. Brian Bartlett posted his number and I'm gonna share it, share oh, it out with yep. the group so that if somebody has a hard time delivering samples in the Southern part of the state, they can contact him and he'll help get them to us. So. I'm going to share out Brian's number. 
Okay, thanks a lot, Brian. Um, <clears throat> if you don't know yet, Brian Bartlett is the president of the New Mexico Wild Sheep Foundation chapter, and he is an excellent resource to go to for any and all things New Mexico Bighorn. Um, he would also be able to facilitate you joining the New Mexico chapter of Bighorn Sheep too, if that's something you're interested in. But um, yeah, feel free to reach out to him with anything. And thank you, Brian, for being on here and being willing to share that. Okay, real quick, I just have one slide on hunting basics because you're all avid hunters and I you know, know what you're doing for the most part. Unique to sheep hunting, I think having very good binoculars and maybe even a scope um, are pretty valuable. With a once in a lifetime hunt, you know, you'd hate to hate to be um, hamstrung a little bit by not not being able to see exactly what you're looking at to make be able to make the call as to whether you go after a group or not, or whether you even find sheep. So if you have to beg, borrow, or, or hopefully not steal, but if you can get your hands on some good glass binoculars and scopes, I recommend you try and do that. No matter where you are, you're gonna be in some, some rugged terrain. So make sure you have good supportive, comfortable boots. Um, you're not going to twist your ankle and and they're either worn in or just ready to go. Uh, you don't want to end up cutting your hunt short because your feet are all blistered up. You know, something I remind myself of time and time again is you can never bring enough water, no matter where you go, um, but even especially in the desert, bring double the amount of water you think you're going to need. And then think about where you're hunting and that you're gonna to need to have appropriate clothing, that picture of Donald Duck, you know, he's he's down on one of those desert hunts in the Caballos and it's nasty right down there right now, it's too hot. Um, whereas you look at that bottom left corner, some of you alpine hunters really could get rained or snowed on during your hunts. So, so make sure you have enough layers and that you can uh, withstand the weather and stay out there. And then gloves, even in the desert, those rocks are sharp. You may consider having some kind of glove to deal with that. And, and those mornings up in the Alpine are pretty frigid. So keeping your hands warm can be important. Uh, that's all I had for hunting basics. So if we got a quick question, we can take it. Otherwise we'll move on. I don't have any questions yet, but if people wanna type, chat, type them into the chat, I'll keep an eye on them and we can come back to them at the end of the next section. That sounds great. So here, this is a pretty important one, you identification for you, for all hunters really, but um, probably most especially are you hunters. So this is a, a classic figure we use in the bighorn world showing different uh, ages and sexes of sheep. If you look all the way to the right, that's a lamb. That next animal is a yearling female. The third animal is an adult female, a ewe. And that fourth animal looks almost identical to the the third animal from the right, and that's a yearling male. And so I wanted to show you that figure to, to give you one example of just how easy it can be to mess up and confuse a yearling ram for an adult ewe. So one thing we've done to address this is we have put together this um, bighorn sheep ewe ram ID that shows you some photographs here and also has some notes on, on how to tell the difference. Um, the main things I'd like to point out is that the ewes have very slender, uh, kind of sometimes spike-like horns, but they're really narrow. And the rams are going to, even as yearlings, they're going to have wider horns, especially at the base. And their horn is going to look a little bit more tapered. So in those top three photos, those are all females. Those are all adult ewes. You can see the really, really narrow horn, even though, you know, some are longer than others. Those middle three photos, that series, those are all young rams. And you can see how if, if you were try, to try to act fast, you may get confused, especially when you look at something like that middle photo. Um, but again, if you focus in on the bases and, and think about whether or not that horn is tapering, that's one way. Another thing you can notice with young rams is that they typically have a shorter, almost more... Um, I don't know, I call it a cuter looking face. So if you look at the very bottom of that flyer, the young ram on the left and the ewe on the right, 
ewes are more likely to have a kind of long horse-like face, while those young rams who may be, you know, about the same size um, and about the same horn length are going to have that shorter kind of rounded off nose. So here I'm just going to show you a series of photos. I think the best way to kind of figure it out is, is to just look at the photos um, and get yourself accustomed to that search image. Here's a U. And this is actually probably a young U. It could be a, a probably a one and a half or two year old, something like that. But notice she does have the really narrow horns. This next photo shows a U in front with a young ram directly behind her. So there, I think you can start to see that, that his horns are much wider at the base. And you can also look at the body size. So he's about the same size as her or smaller, but he has those wider bases. All other rams are gonna be bigger in body size. So here's a mixed group. Um, I wish my cursor worked here, but what I'd like to point out in this group, so if you start from the left, you've got a couple little light lambs, and then that first adult you see is an adult ewe, and then you move to the right, and there's a sheep that's pretty well blocked um, by another adult ewe. So I wanted to bring this up because I don't know for sure what that middle sheep is, but it's it's giving me some doubt that it's an adult you because it has a shorter face, but its body size is similar to that adult you, um, which means it could be, you know, a, male, a younger male. And those horns look like they could be potentially wider, but the, the message here is if you don't know for sure, then don't shoot it. Um, yeah, here's another great example of how, how it can be a little tricky. The animal all the way on the left is an adult ewe. The animal just to the right, but all the way in the back is a young ram, like uh, that would be like a um, two-year-old ram. And then in front of him is a yearling ewe. Notice how short her horns are. And then to the right and in front of her is a yearling ram. And so those two yearlings, if you look at their faces, you can kind of get a sense for what I'm talking about with that cuter, shorter face. Um, <clears throat> and then when you compare the horns on the two yearlings, you, you can see that that front animal, that ram has wider bases already. All right, so I want you to take a second, look at this page and think about whether these are rams, young rams or ewes. I'll give you a second. My hint is everything on this page is the same sex. I imagine that upper right animal gives it away, but these are all young rams. Here's a couple more photos of some young rams. I think that that animal on the left, maybe you can tell there, but it, it's just wider at the bases, short face. Um, you see that taper a lot more to the end than some of those really narrow horns on the U that kind of carry the same amount of weight throughout the horn. And here's just a series of U photos to kind of um, get in your brains, I guess. Note the, um, the bottom left, note that kind of longer horse-like face I was talking about. And of course, you can always look underneath. Um, you'd be surprised how often, how often you can get close enough to tell that way. This is the last one here. On the left, we have a U with actually some kind of funny horns. Um, of course, to the right and back, there's a young ram. He's he's more of a two-year-old ram. You can um, tell he's got a bigger body on him and his horns are, they're a little more obviously wider. And then in front is a lamb. And, and I don't know for sure, but I would venture to guess that that's actually a ram lamb. Okay, that, that wraps up the U identification section. Um, if folks are interested 
we do have that you young ram identification flyer on our website but if people are interested i can i can go ahead and email that to uh all the you hunters i did drop that link in the chat caitlin but i think it might be helpful to to send that link out so people have okay. it in emails as well um yeah. and one question that we got on this are do the young rams have more of a bulbous forehead Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I would encourage you to to look at your photos. And if that's something you think you're picking out um, based on the guides, then, you know, use that in your arsenal as as something um, to help distinguish. And, you know, if you're talking about right at the horn bases, I think that's probably true. Anything else? Not on, on telling the difference, but I did have one that came on on hunting. Um, and if a ram is collared, is it huntable? Yes. And same for a you, is a you that's collared huntable? Yes. Yeah, I don't think we should have any uh, collared ewes in the Pecos. Uh, that said, there could be collared rams uh, in a lot of our units. And yeah, they're, they're all huntable. You know, if we'd ask that you return the collar, to us because we might be able to get some data off of it if if you shoot one but you know don't don't let the presence of a collar deter you from shooting a, a ram you'd like to great and then the, the last comment i got on this is that brian wanted to make sure you knew that that was very well done very clear so well, that was a huge okay. comment. <laughs> all right great you know one thing i'll add if you do end up shooting shooting harvesting a um collared animal they're likely to have an ear tag that says do not consume on it. And we put that on there at the time of capture because very often we have to give some sort of drug, whether it be a dewormer, antibiotic, or maybe even a sedative. And, and that tag has to go on there because nobody can eat meat from an animal that's had any of those drugs within the first 60 days. We don't have any animals that have been captured within that time frame at this point. So everybody should be good to go in terms of uh, eating meat from any kind of marked animal. And another question that came in, um, are ram hunts and ewe hunts at different times or different seasons? Yep, there shouldn't be any overlap with our ram and ewe hunters. Good question. And I think we're ready for the next session section then if you are. Okay. So one thing we've heard that folks might be interested in, lear <clears throat> in learning about is ram aging. Um, you know, bighorn are, are pretty cool in that they carry their horns their whole lives. Of course, uh, from the game and fish standpoint, you ram hunters, any ram is legal. So as long as it's a ram, uh, you're good to go. That said, you know, it's a once in a lifetime hunt and we get some people that are, are maybe more interested in a higher scoring ram or or harvesting an older ram in order to kind of give most younger rams the chance to get their genes out. So because we've heard some interest from people on that, I thought I would at least go through um, some of the basics of ram aging. And first I'll talk about the way that we age rams when we do our surveys, and that's by breaking them into different classes. So I have that same figure on the left that we used before when we talked about the use. But if you look at the four leftmost <clears throat> animals, it's it's different classes of rams ranging from youngest to oldest. Um, and we call them class one, class two, class three, with class four being the oldest. And I'm not sure if you can see, but uh, class ones are typically two and a half. Class twos are more three and a half to six. Class threes are usually six to eight, with our oldest rams usually being class four. The most helpful image for me is on the right there. And if you have a side view of a ram, that gives you an idea of what class they would fall in based on, on that uh, viewpoint. So the oldest animals are going to have the longest horns, which <clears throat> basically are gonna be curling up and almost reaching the eye. And that'd be that class four ram. So just to just to um, have you guys get some eyes on some different age classes, here's some example of some class one rams. You know, these are a little 
These are more obviously not used, but not really a whole lot bigger. <clears throat> Moving up to some class two rams, and here we start to see a lot more mass at the base of the horns. Um, <clears throat> and they stretch back, they're kind of uh, like the length of a sickle almost. They're often very pointy on the end still, and they don't they come down a little bit past the eye, but don't get to the eye quite yet when you're thinking about how much of the circle that horn wraps around. Here's a series of photos of class three rams. And so very often class threes are still gonna have a relatively pointy horn. Um, they may not, it may be a little bit, um, more broken off and dull and less pointy. We call that broomed. And I'll give you an example of a broomed horn in the next slide. But again, these are kind of your like five to seven, five to eight year old rams. And these are the oldest, the oldest uh, age class. These are class four rams. <clears throat> Here you can see that they really lose that pointy tip for the most part. Um, and we call that brooming when they've actually been broken off there. If you have a ram with any kind of brooming that, that meets, uh, starts to come up above the eye, you can, you can rest assured it's getting to be an old ram. Um, another thing to notice on these class four rams is just notice how when you look at the, the circumference at the base and see that it carries a long ways around the horn instead of tapering off pretty fast. That's another indication that this is this is an older ram, if that's what you're looking for. <clears throat> so I thought I would show you a um, couple photos and we can kind of talk about what, what we might be looking at in terms of class. And another reason I like to talk about class is that if you are to call up or email and ask for any kind of survey information from me, that's how they're gonna be broken down. So that, that gives you an idea of, you know, if I say there's 10 class four rams on the mountain, now you know what I'm talking about. So this ram right here, I would probably call a class four. So you see that he doesn't, the end of the horn doesn't quite come up to the eye, but that's because it's broken off. So had that tip still been there, it probably would have extended all the way up and and that's definitely a class four ram. Right here, we've got, these are kind of hard to tell from, from the front view. And so, you know, another important thing to go over, it's good to try and get different angles on, on sheep you're trying to judge. Um, you know, my, my initial thought is that that ram on the left is a class three and that ram on the right probably class four, but I'd want, I'd want to get a look at him. He definitely carries that mass a long way around. Here we have another example of, of two impressive rams, but that one on the left is, is definitely younger. He's a class three, probably. And that one on the right, you can just looking at him, see the mass. Um, he looks like he has pretty big bases. If you look at that gap between the two, between the two horns on top of his head, it's pretty narrow. So in this photo, the oldest ram is that one that's in the center. And I imagine at this point, a lot of you are starting to pick up on that. Here's a photo from our Red Rock facility. These are all desert rams. Um, and that ram on, on the left is definitely the highest scoring, probably the oldest, but that ram in the middle is more of a class three. So hopefully this is just put, putting in your mind, um, you know, what might be out there and things to think about depending on, on what your goals are. Okay, that kind of, oh no, shoot, I have one more, one more slide here. So you could really spend a lot of time uh, studying this. Here's a a reference I've come across that I recommend if you really want to get into understanding how to age sheep. Every year, those sheep are, are going to lay down a, a ring, like a tree. We call it an annuli. 
And so if you have a good scope, you know, there's even potential if you had a good view at a RAM, you could count the rings through the scope and try and figure out how old it is. But I do recommend you check out this reference if that's something you're really interested in. I see we're at 6.30, so um, I understand if folks have to drop off. I think, I don't think I have a whole lot of slides left. Um, are there questions that have popped up, Tristana? No, I don't have any questions just yet. Okay. But I will um, let everybody know that we we are recording this and we will be putting it out there. Um, so Caitlin can share the link with you um, if you want to review any of the information or come back to um, gather something that you might have missed. So that'll be up in the next few days. Cool. Yeah. Thanks for reminding everybody. So I thought I'd talk briefly about scoring. Again, this is all dependent on, on what you're going for as a hunter. I know that some people are going to be interested in how RAM scores uh, on the Boone and Crockett scale. So I am honestly not the best at this, um, but I'm going to tell you some of the tips I've picked up. And if it's something that you, you really want to practice, I encourage you to explore the internet and reach out to, you know, people who have hunted bighorn before to get some other tips. So the, the big things, I guess I would say, to pay attention to when you're trying to judge and compare horn size amongst rams are the length of the horn, how far around that circle does the horn come, the drop of the horn. When you're looking from the side, how far down does the horn drop? So is it dropping below the jaw or is it a little bit tighter? And the more the drop, the longer the horn. Kind of what goes along with that is how big is the hoop? So instead of looking at the drop, if you look at that space inside of the circle that the horn makes, what can you fit in there? You know, if you're looking at a few rams and you think, well, I could fit, maybe I could fit a softball in that hoop. Oh, but on this other ram, you know, I might, be able to fit a, a honeydew or a melon. Like that's an indication that that ram's probably going to be a lot longer. Look at the bases. If a ram has bigger bases, um, that's going to give it, you know, more points all around. So I think that's probably the hardest thing to assess uh, from a distance. You can look at the space between the horns on top or the space between the horns and the ears. And then just look at the mass and how it carries or doesn't carry throughout that horn. If it, if it seems to maintain the same, com the same circumference for a long way, um, that probably means it's gonna have solid mass measurements all throughout the horn. Whereas if it, it tapers down more quickly, you know, then you're gonna see some, some shrinking on those circumference measurements. I mean, if you really wanna geek out on this stuff, um, there's a, there's a lot of resources out there. I'd be happy to talk to you more about it, but that's honestly kind of the limitation of my knowledge on scoring. So I thought real quick, I would show you some photos of some rams, let you look at them, think about, maybe think about them, compare them against each other. Um, what you might think would be bigger or smaller in terms of score, you know, they're all solid, mature rams, really representative. And I think anybody would be happy to harvest any of those. These are deserts. So let me give you a minute to look at them and, and then I'll show what the scores are. Okay. So probably most of you guessed that bottom ram was the biggest. Um, you know, the big thing to look at with him is that hoop. He definitely has that widest space inside his horn. And you see that horn drop well below his chin. When you look at this ram on the upper right, you know, he's also a really solid, amazing ram. He carries mass all around his horn, but it doesn't drop quite as much as, as the other one. And also the tip doesn't come up quite as high. So we've got one more slide here, folks. So these are all Rockies. And I think I split this up so that you could look at the top two first. kind of assess them. The scores on those top two, that left one's actually bigger, though the right one is massive. We'll do the same thing on those bottom two. Okay, 
So that RAM on the right actually scores higher than the RAM on the left, but that RAM on the left seems so long. And so part of that is actually just the bases. The bases of that RAM on the left are, are smaller, which puts all those circumference measurements um, a, little, a little lower. But again, every RAM on this page is, is stellar. All right, with that, that's, that's the end of my slideshow. I'd be happy to take a few questions for a couple minutes. I'm sure we could talk sheet forever, but why don't we um, see what we can talk about in the next five to 10 minutes? So one of the questions that came in, Caitlin, are how many total tags for both species? So let me think. I'm not sure right off the top of my head. It's usually around 50 to 60 when you combine the two species. Um, I think it's probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 to 23 public draw tags. And then we have a couple, we have a raffle and auction hunter in each unit. Sorry, then, I'm cleaning up my desktop here. I guess I could stop sharing. <laughs> Perfect. Um, the other question might be one of ethics or um, if you have a retirement coming up in the next couple of weeks, but um, Mark would like to know if you would come guide for him. <laughs> Maybe. I'm not going <laughs> to rule anything out, but uh, I'm going to be doing this for a while yet, so I might have to wait. Um, okay, and then is the Rio Grande Gorge open all the way to the Colorado border? And if so, is there any record sheep that far north? I'm not sure the farthest north that a sheep has been harvested, but we very commonly will see short, but sheep as far north as the um, wild rivers and scenic uh, BLM monument, uh, just kind of east or west of Cuesta. But we have we have known sheep to go all the way to that Colorado line. Um, I'm not sure what the northernmost ram has been has been. It's an interesting question. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll give everybody just a minute to type if they. Oh, here's another one. Um, how often do deserts usually go to water? That's a great question. Uh, I would say it, <clears throat> it depends on the time of year. Um, at the hottest times of year, they may be going in every few days. Um, but outside of that, if there's been good rain, they may not be going in to drinkers per se at all. They may be able to get what they need from their forage. Interesting. Okay, I have several comments that have come in and just thank you so much for your time, Caitlin, and putting this all together and to, to both of you guys, to all of you guys for being here and sharing your knowledge with everybody. Um, lots of good compliments and um, saying it's very helpful and insightful, so much appreciated. Great um, deal. One more question that came in. Um, area closure boundary description for Rio Grande Gorge. Ah, I'm glad somebody brought that up. Yeah, so the BLM does have a couple areas that are closed. Um, you know, obviously that, that's kind of on you all to make sure you're, you're hunting where you should be. But I do have some maps for where the BLM is closed to hunting. And I'll put that on my list as something to send out to you. Um, just, just to say here for the record, the Urea Verde area near Rio Grande Gorge and the junction with Rio de Pueblo de Taos that's called the Rio Verde, uh, and that's close to hunting. And then that Wild Rivers and Scenic area I was telling you about to the north, which is west of Cuesta, on the east side of the river, that's closed as well. And then there's a small closure around John Dunn Bridge, but I'll try and get these maps out this week to everybody. Okay, and I'll keep an eye on any more questions that come in in the next minute, but thank you to everyone who joined us tonight. We apologize for the technical difficulties and, and thank you for bearing with us through those. So um, good luck on your hunts. Yep, feel free to reach out with anything as, as questions come up, we'd be happy to hear from you. And if you have any advice for how we run this next year, let us know. Caitlin, I just wanted to take a second to thank all of you guys as hunters. You're kind of our, our front line and better understanding our populations and how the disease is affecting them. So we really, really appreciate everything you guys are doing for our bighorn sheep populations. Yeah, for sure.
And I all think right. with that, we've answered all the questions. So uh, any closing comments, Caitlin, or should we just wrap it up? I'm good. Nope, happy to wrap it up. I appreciate everybody taking the time to tune in. Yeah.